he entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary, who moreover was listening to the Lord's word, seated at his feet. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary, really only one. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Well, good morning again. It is a privilege and an honor always to be invited to speak here. The title of our message this morning is Seek to Serve, and our scripture focus is Luke 10, verses 38 through 42, the story of Jesus, Martha, and Mary. As a church, we have been focusing on what God's word tells us we should seek with an emphasis on 2 Peter 1, 10, and 11. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling in choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Today we focus on what it means to seek to serve, touching upon the first step only of service. Dr. David Jeremiah, in one of his devotionals for November 5th, writes the following, and it was so poignant to this message this morning, I'm just going to read it to you. Scripture teaches that every Christian is given spiritual gifts at the time of their salvation. Each Christian is divinely gifted to serve as part of Christ's body, to be the hands and the heart of Jesus. These gifts showing mercy, teaching, serving, leading, encouraging, and more are to be used for the building up of the church and serving Christ. But our spiritual gifts aren't the only ways we serve Christ. Each of us has natural talents and abilities that God gives us, and we are to use them to serve him as well. Why do we have these gifts and abilities? To, quote, serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Our leadership skills, our communication proudness, our compassion may help us in our career or family life, but ultimately we are to use all God has given us to serve him. And in doing so, we are to, quote, do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Peter tells us, quote, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, that in all things God may be glorified, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. As you serve those around you through your gifts and abilities, remember you are serving Christ and bringing glory to God. The greatest satisfaction and fulfillment in the heart and life of any person comes first by understanding the relationship that God desires to have with man, and then seeking to serve the Lord as we serve those around us through the gifts and abilities God has granted to us. It defines our purpose, calling in life, the reason for our being. God offers us the answers to what we seek through a personal relationship with him. A relationship that is fully disclosed in the pages of the Word of God, the Bible, and revealed through the Holy Spirit. A relationship that is offered, not forced on us, where we accept or reject God's offer by our own free will. A relationship that one enters into through the love, mercy, grace, and sacrifice of God's only Son, who willingly came to restore God's creation, man, into a right relationship with Him a relationship in which God desires to commune with his creation. God desires not only to talk and to walk with you, but to teach you his will, his word, and that man would praise and worship him alone as the one true God and savior of us all, creating a oneness with the living God through his spirit living in our heart. 
restoring man into a fellowship with God, fellowship which has been broken by the sin of Adam, the first man through his disobedience, by which has been restored through the blood and the sacrifice of one who was without sin, whose death on the cross and resurrection has provided the only way to the Father and eternal fellowship with God, the name that is above every name that is named, the name of Jesus Christ. This Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, came to serve and to seek and to save the lost. And he promises everyone, sinner and saved, who seek him will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And once found, we must then submit to his will as Jesus submitted to his Father's will. Mark 10, 45 declared, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. John 5, 30 declares where Jesus said, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus, who wishes that none shall perish, no, not even one, but rather that all would come, asking us simply to accept, believe, and confess him as our Savior and Lord, and allowing his will to become our will, and in doing so, maintaining his absolute lordship over our life as we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Fulfilling the greatest of the New Testament commandments found in Matthew 27, 37 through 39, where Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. God's promise found in John 12, 26, Jesus also declared, If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Jesus Christ remains the ultimate example of one who sought and was seeking to serve. The ultimate example of a servant's heart, giving himself totally for each of us, even to death on the cross. It all begins when we follow the example of Jesus to surrender our will to his, allowing God to live and work in us through us by his Holy Spirit to his glory, empowering us to be ready, willing, and then able to do all things through him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Can someone say amen? amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and we thank you. We pray for your anointing of this vessel to bring forth your word, that the hearts be open and ready to receive all that you have, and that your will, your will alone will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind requires me to submit to God by placing myself physically, intellectually, and spiritually in a place where God can equip me as a believer for his service. It becomes a matter of choice, of free will, and focusing on three simple questions. Am I ready? Am I willing? Am I able? Let's start with the first one. Am I ready? As a football coach for many years, when I lined the players up on the field, we got them going with a cadence where the captains would shout out, are you ready? And the players would say, yes, sir. <laughs> now I know there's a couple football players out, they would yell back, ready. But that was enough, we'd say it again, are you ready? And they'd say, ready. ready. We're getting there, let's do it as a church. Are you ready? ready. Praise the Lord for that. But were they really ready? They didn't see the practice plan. They had no idea what us coaches had in store for them. You see, we say we're ready, but are we really ever ready for what's going to come? Am I ready for the test? Well, maybe. Could I have studied more? Yes. Am I ready for a career change? Maybe. But have I really researched all my options? Am I ready for a relationship, a commitment, possibly marriage? The answer is definitely no. And those who are married here can tell you every day of marriage is a new enlightening experience. Amen. Am I ready to meet Jesus? Yes. I pray you are. See, we can prep, we can predict, we can figure probabilities, even project the outcomes, but we never really know what will happen because it's out of our hands. Only God knows a truth that we must learn to accept by faith 
and believe it. We say we are ready. We even shout it to encourage ourselves, to move us forward, or perhaps to distract us from the present situation we face, providing us hope for something better in the future. Jesus, the great I am, provides us with hope, with a promise that the world cannot. God's word unchanging and always true. We sang just a few moments ago, great is thy faithfulness. Listen again to one of the verses and let it penetrate deep into your heart. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to God. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. The hymnist writes here a great summary of the desires of man's heart and also the promises of God. Beginning with the pardon of sin, the removal of a condemnation and guilt that can only be taken away by the blood of the lamb that was shed in Calvary. A peace that endureth, peace that we're always looking for. A world we live in out of control that's looking for what? Peace. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. There is joy in the presence of the Lord forevermore. The guiding of the Holy Spirit to lead us. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with 10,000 beside. What joy. And contained in the word joy is the key to the promise. Take the letters J-O-Y as an acronym. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. You want joy in your life and seek to serve the Lord? Put Jesus first, others second, and yourselves last. For it is in Christ alone that our hope is found, our strength. For through man it is impossible. Until I'm on board with Jesus, until I surrender to Jesus Christ, I will never be ready to face what a sin-filled world throws at me every moment of every day. But with Jesus, the hymnist writes, morning by morning, new mercies I will see. Am I ready? Really ready to serve? Then I need to be ready to accept Jesus first as my Savior and then as my Lord. It is the greatest decision you will face in your life because it will determine your future now and for eternity. Secondly, am I willing? Am I willing to serve as often followed by parameters we set? I'm willing to serve as long as it's during the hours of 3 and 4 p.m. and never on weekends. Here, I am willing means if I'm available. Am I willing to work? As long as I get paid this much, after all, I'm worth it, even entitled to it. Now let's remember that self-esteem counts only if you want to live with a false truth about your life. I'm willing to do this if you're willing to do that, the quip or quo we hear with our politicians. What's in it for me? Am I willing to, if I get recognition for it, if I get credit for it someplace? We see the old pride rising up in each of these, drawing attention to oneself. Am I willing is not about us. Jesus paid it all. You didn't pay it, and I didn't pay it. We didn't go to the cross. All to him, each of us, each of us owes. Jesus did everything in his life to fulfill the will of his Father, and in doing so, Jesus never once said, what's in it for me? Am I willing to, directly tied to the invitation that Jesus makes to us to come to him, to kneel at the foot of the cross and confess, I am a sinner, and to receive his forgiveness? And then like the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 8, we can then declare, here am I, Lord, send me. The question before us as followers of Jesus Christ, as a Christian, is am I willing this day, every day, to recommit myself and surrender all my will to him and allow his will yeah. to be done through me. Then thirdly, am I able? Were I always able to do higher math? Not when I entered kindergarten. Were I able to drive a car? Not at the age of two. Were I able to make good choices in life? Certainly not when I was a teenager. Were I always able to make the right choices as a parent raising my children? I wish I could say yes, but that's not true either. All the responsibilities of the day weigh upon us. Am I able is less a question of can I, but am I willing to trust the one who can by faith? One who is willing to teach me what I need to know and when I need to know it and when I have to learn, when I've learned it, use it to fulfill 
God's will and not mine in service to him. Jesus, again, is the servant whose example we are to follow. In him is all knowledge and truth. He sees all, knows all, is all. And by surrendering my will to his, then I'm able to become more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And through him, able to face the lions as Daniel did, or to be able to be thrown into the fiery furnace when people attack my credibility or who I am, or to stand before a priest like of Jezebel and call down fire upon the altar like Elijah did, building my faith to the point of a mustard seed, the smallest seed, that I might say to the mountains that hold me back, the things that weigh down on me, be removed and cast into the sea in Jesus' name, and it will be done. How awesome is the God we serve. Amen? Amen. But am I able to accept that I'm a sinner first, that I'm in need of salvation, that unless I'm born again, I will not enter the kingdom of heaven, that to become like Jesus, the king, I must become a servant first of the king and then live my life in service to him as my Lord. Am I ready, willing, and able to make that commitment again today or for the very first time? If you're not turned to me with Luke at this time, turn to Luke 10. Let's take a look at our story of the two sisters, Martha and Mary, who learn what it means to seek to serve. Luke 10, 38 provides us a setting for our text this morning. It reads, now as they were traveling, this would be Jesus and his entourage. He entered a village, this village is Bethany, and a woman named Martha welcomed her into his, her home. Martha welcomed him, Jesus, into her home. It said home is where the heart is. Well, Martha's actions can be compared to accepting Jesus Christ into your heart, inviting him into your life. Now, we must assume based on the statement, welcomed him, that just Jesus was invited into Martha's home and not his entourage. We also don't know if there were any other people present in the house at this time because none are mentioned in the scripture. Verse 39, she, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his words. So we have to understand that Jesus comes in, Martha invites Jesus in, then Martha must have exited the room for a moment, and when she returns, we have to get the picture of Jesus is seated, and here Mary is kneeling in front of Jesus, focused on him. What happens next? I call the classic relatives visiting at the holiday story, okay? I think every family has that one relative who comes for the holiday and then just sits in one place, and the only time they move is towards the food table. Well, that wasn't the case with Mary, because you see, she was already at the dinner table, being fed by the word of life in person. Remember Jesus' words from Matthew 4.4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus was speaking directly to her. Jesus will later share that he is the bread of life, the living word of God. At this moment in her life, Mary made the critical choice to stop, listen, and to learn. She placed herself in the best place possible directly in front of Jesus at his feet. And there chose at that place the entire focus of her thoughts and everything upon the Savior. Mary was now ready to receive every word and willing to accept whatever happened next. Now, at this point, a study of the meaning of names can be very revealing. You know, every name has a meaning. Your name has a meaning, so does mine. Mary means star of the sea. Before Jesus this day, Mary was shining forth from all the others in the sea of humanity because she was chose that place herself physically at the feet of Jesus, intellectually ready to receive every word of life shared, and spiritually she was basking in the presence of the one who shines like the sun. Every name is wonderful in God's sight, but how a name is received by others or remembered positively or not so positively, is directly based on the actions and the attitudes of the one who bears the name and how they use the gifts and abilities granted to them by God. The name Martha means lady. Now, I've known many wonderful ladies named Martha in my life. 
However, in our text today, Martha's actions and attitudes are reflective of a character of a person who chose to focus on the wrong things and her actions and attitudes reflected. With that said, let's get to know Martha, Mary's older sister, a little bit better. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with all her preparations and she came up to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? And then she says, tell her to help me. The grumbling, the complaining is started. You know, the first thing that struck me is Martha's unfair accusations against her sister Mary. It isn't that Mary couldn't help or even wouldn't help. In fact, Martha supports this when she says to Jesus, tell her to help me. She definitely was capable. But it is here that we see the qualities of a servant that when attacked for doing what's right and a servant's heart at work in Mary, Mary responds by saying nothing. She does what James 1.19 says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow in anger. Mary is focused, focused on Jesus. She's not going to be torn to the left or the right. She's not even going to look left or right. She's going to be focused right upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we have no record of what Jesus says to her, but we know Mary is absorbing every word, processing every thought, ready, willing, and able, because she has surrendered this moment in time to submit to Jesus and not the will of man, or in this case, the will of a woman, a lady, Martha. For you see, her sister, Martha, was not focused on Jesus. It says in verse 40, Martha is distracted. What are you thinking about right now, at this very moment in time? If God could reveal it and put it up here on our big screens, what would we be seeing? Interesting, I heard this week a speaker talk about Facebook. Facebook Corporation is working on a chip to implant in people's minds that would allow you to control without touching all of your electronic devices. They're also saying that they would have the ability to read other people's minds that you meet. Pretty scary, isn't it? When is man going to wake up to the simple fact that you're messing with God's perfect creation and that God does not take this lightly? That the wrath of God is going to fall on man as man continues to try to make himself God. Amen. 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 That judgment is coming. That judgment will fall upon those that do not know him and have accepted him as Savior and Lord. Martha is just like us. We get distracted. She allowed herself to be distracted, <laughs> planning for something that Jesus was not even interested in at all. We don't know if he came for the meal. In fact, let's put Martha's thoughts up here if we could. This is something I just came up with. Follow along with me. Here's Martha, right? The Lord is here. What do I do? What do I say? What do I serve? What does Jesus like or dislike? Do I have enough of this or that? Is the house clean? How do I set the table? Which tablecloth do I use? What do I serve first? What does Jesus like to eat, drink? How many will be staying? How much food do I need? What do I wear? And are there enough candles and lamps? Do, who sits where at the table? Do I have enough pillows for all? What if more come than I have the food to feed or places to sit? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Now, this was based on some heavy research based upon years of us holding Thanksgiving for my wife's family. <laughs> She won't admit to all of it, but I've lived through it, okay? I've seen it all. Now, you can take Martha's situation and just plug in whatever causes you the greatest stress and anxiety in your life, whatever that situation is. For me, you know it. It's the technology stuff. I just can't do it, and it drives me crazy, and all these thoughts become mine. But you see how quickly... How quickly we come distracted. And we need to remember what Isaiah 55 says. And when the Lord said, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. Martha's thoughts certainly weren't right with what God was saying. You see, the meal Martha is planning on serving is already being served. It's all set. Martha is missing it. And isn't that just like us sometimes? Mary is listening and learning. Martha is stressed and scattered. When you're stressed and scattered, you don't focus on what you should think before you speak. And here's what Lady Martha said. And she, Martha, came up to him, Jesus, and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. 
No, Martha doesn't go to Mary and whisper, could you come and help me, please? No, instead, she publicly and loudly goes directly to Jesus, the guest she invited, the guest of honor, to file her complaint against her lazy, quote-unquote, shining star of the sea sister, Mary. Now, Martha and Mary may have had some sibling rivalry going on, we don't know, but Mary was the younger. And in that culture, she had certain tasks that she would have been responsible for that Martha expected her to perform. But Mary was focused on Jesus and him alone. And that angered Martha. It's Martha's house. It's her party. Martha, not Mary, invited Jesus in. And Martha now complains about it to the guest of honor. In my teaching years as a history teacher, one of the things I tried to do was make history come alive. And I would create characters, and I would come dressed in period clothing. And one of those characters was a man by the name of Mr. Pettyworth. He was an older gentleman, but he was an early American school teacher in the 1800s. And he stayed for three days. And he had a bell to ring, and he had tight boards for the students to write with chalk on and primers for them to learn. And the focus was to learn proper etiquette for young boys and girls in school in public places. And the last day was at a dance. In fact, we taught them how to dance with the 12-inch rule. I'd be speaking in between. But they learned the proper way of doing things. Well, here's some lessons in etiquette we can take from this. First, you don't go to the guest of honor and file complaints about your family or friends. You don't embarrass anyone, number two, in front of others in the hope of getting them willing to do what you want. And thirdly, you don't fabricate facts falsifying facts to further your personal agenda. Facts are facts, and they speak for themselves. While we are taught in Scripture to turn to the Lord first with all our needs, remember, it is to be in the form of a request, followed by, not my will, but thine will be done, instead of a demand. Martha here, however, says, tell her to help me. Martha has lost her focus. Martha is not only demanding, she is even condescending in her remarks to Jesus. She then says, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? She is not only condescending here, but she's lying as well. Mary is right there in front of Jesus and she hasn't done or said anything. Now at this point, picture with me, Jesus turns his attention from focusing on Mary right in front and he turns towards Martha. And I have to imagine that Mary's attention turned as well. And we can imagine the face of Mary and Jesus as they look at Mary, of Martha, you're out of control. James 4.3 declares that you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives to serve your own pleasures. Those pleasures in this case are rooted in jealousy and pride. How do we know it's pride and jealousy? Martha is loud and public with her accusations against Mary instead of humbly and calmly taking Mary aside and reproving her in love privately. We have a pretty good idea of Martha's mental state at this time, but we don't know about her physical condition. Yet her actions support that her mental state was reflective of her inability to serve a dinner, which I'm sure she's done many times before. She was completely immobilized by the pride and jealousy that was welling up in her. The same thing that happens with anger, the same thing that happens with fear. When we allow these things that God says, do not let them into your heart and life. Protect our hearts against them to enter in. At this time, Jesus, being Jesus, sees our confusion. Jesus, being Jesus, sees your situation, your anxiety, your fear, your confusion and he speaks words of life and peace to them. Verse 41 and 42, But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha, whenever you see in Scripture something repeated, it means listen up. It's very important. And I think also here, too, you want to know, talking to someone who's kind of lost their control Sometimes you have to repeat their name twice to get their attention. But Jesus speaks to the issue. Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. Are you here this morning? Is there something worrying you, bothering you, inhibiting you, causing you to become immobilized 
as a servant of Christ. Remember, Jesus knows what we need before we ask him. Focus, Martha. Only one thing is necessary, and it is nothing that you're asking for. For Mary over here, the shining star of the sea, has chosen the good part. And what's that part? What is right and good to do in the sight of God. To stop. Stop running around. Running away from me, says the Lord. Running away from what I'm calling you to. Sit here at my feet. Listen to my words. Rest in my presence. Martha, listen. Mary has chosen what shall not be taken away. And she has chosen me before all else. And so can you. Now, we don't have a record of what happens next. And I don't like to add things into the story that aren't present there. But I think we're pretty confident that Martha at this point probably broke down in tears, fell at the feet of Jesus and asked forgiveness. Her heart was changed. She stopped her preparations, listened to the words of Jesus, learned from Jesus the necessary first step in having one's heart changed of a servant's heart of seeking to serve. A heart must be ready, willing, and able to serve. We must choose to submit it and surrender all to Jesus. Only then, through the power of his Holy Spirit and God's word, can we follow him as a true servant of the Lord Most High. There are so many wonderful lessons to take from the scripture verse this day. First, that we, when we are distracted from focusing on the Lord, we will err, making poor choices, judgments, even if we've invited Jesus into our home, into our hearts, we will err. Secondly, Martha is neither ready, willing, nor able to receive Jesus because her focus is not on him, it's on preparations. Are you hustling, bustling, getting ready for this and that, missing in the process what God desires for her and for you, which is right in front of us? You know, with the holidays coming, we get so distracted Preparations, planning, cleaning, wanting everything to be just so. We only would spend the same attention focusing on the Lord at his feet, resting, listening, and learning. Getting our focus on what truly matters, that is what will truly make this season and every season and every day, as my good wife says, the best day ever. Keep Jesus at the center of all you do. Invite him to take that seat of honor, not only at the table of your celebration, but the table of your heart. Thanking God as families gather for sending Jesus the greatest gift ever given to mankind into this world to seek and to save the lost, to seek and to save you and me and everyone in this community and in this world. Are you willing are you ready to answer God's call this morning? To accept, believe, and confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Are you willing to surrender and submit your will to live your life according to his will? Are you able? The answer is yes. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Amen. Jesus invites you to take that place of Mary at his feet right now, to stop, listen, to learn. It's an open invitation anytime, anywhere. If your commitment to follow Jesus is real and sincere, then seek him diligently for his calling in your life. And as you serve those around you through the gifts and abilities granted to you, maintain the Lordship of Christ by fixing your focus on Christ alone, remembering to give all the glory and honor and praise to him. Jeremiah 29, 13 and 14 said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me yeah. with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Seek to serve the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning? And take your red hymnals, if you will, please. Turn to number 408. We're gonna close with the hymn, I Surrender All. And then we're going to close with prayer. All are invited to stay afterwards for a time of fellowship and food. And if there are additional prayer needs that you have that you'd like to pray for, we'll be here to pray with you. Number 408, I surrender all. Let's sing all four verses because they all just have such words to minister to us. 
All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily he live. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that Thou art mine, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus. I surrender, I surrender all. I'm going to challenge you this week, because all of you have those wonderful phone devices. I have a flip phone, so I can't do this. But you can, if you have a smartphone. Before you go to your prayer time in your closet this week, I want you to bring up on your phone the words to I surrender all. And I want you to sing them. And I want you to focus upon them. And I want you to pray that the Lord would take these words and embed them and write them on the tablets of your heart because they are a prayer in themselves, a prayer each of us needs to offer up to the Lord, the prayer that starts us on the first step to serving Christ and being a servant of the Lord Most High. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this time this morning. For the word that you brought forth, Father God, may it truly be words that penetrate our hearts. Father, may it go forward like a two-edged sword. May it draw us near and nigh unto you. May it be used to further your kingdom upon this earth in glory and might. Father God, I would pray right now, if there are any hearing this message this morning that have never accepted Christ for the first time, Father, I pray, Father God, that this would be the day of their salvation. That, Lord, they would repeat the simple prayer, Jesus Forgive me of my sin. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, that you were raised from the dead, and now sit at the right hand of God the Father. And I confess you with my lips and receive your Holy Spirit into my heart. Lord, become the Lord of my life now and make me a servant in your sight. If you pray that prayer, you're a new creation in Christ. I encourage you to get into a church of fellowship. If not, come back here and join us. But find a place and get a Bible and open it up to the Gospel of John. And beginning of John 1.1, 1, 1, begin to read the Word and ask God, the teacher, the teacher of all things, by the power of His Spirit, to reveal Himself to you. And the promise of Jeremiah is that He will. He will answer you. 
He will reveal to you. He will teach you. He will prepare you so that you are ready, willing, and able to go forth into this world to further his kingdom, his kingdom and his love. Heavenly Father, if there are ones here this morning that need to rededicate their life, I pray that if they haven't done it already, right now they'll say, Jesus, I rededicate my life to you. I surrender all, whatever that area of my life may be, whatever thing that I know that I'm doing that I should not do, because the scripture says, when I know it's right and fail to do it, it becomes sin for me. The littlest is as big as the greatest sin. But we know that God knows all. He sees all. Stop running. Stop running. Turn to him. Let him cleanse you and let him restore you again. <clears throat> Father God, we pray now for the food and fellowship that will follow. And we pray for each person here and those that were not present, that you'll bless them where they are. Watch over and protect them until we join again here next week. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, the praise. In Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, amen. amen and amen. Hey, greet someone next to you. Give them a hug or a handshake. It's so good to have you all in the house of the Lord this morning. God bless you. Thank you, Aaron.